Time now for Iron Africa here on Fast Fan Cat. Thanks for joining us. The headlines. Guilty of crimes against humanity. Two Rwandan mayors are handed life sentences by a Paris court over their role in the 1994 genocide. In Rwanda, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu visits the country's genocide memorial and remembers the two nations' tragic histories. And a court in South Africa sentences Blade Runner sprinter Oscar Pistorius to six years behind bars for the murder of girlfriend Riva Stinkham. Welcome. A court here in Paris has handed down life sentences to two Rwandan mayors tried over the 1994 genocide in their country. Octavian Ngezi and Tito Barahira were found guilty of crimes against humanity for orchestrating the massacre of hundreds of Tutsis. Some 2,000 people had sought refuge in a church in their village where they were then bludgeoned and hacked to death. After a lengthy trial here in Paris, two former Rwandan mayors, Octavian Ngenzi and Tito Barahiro, uh, were found guilty and condemned to life in prison, found guilty of genocide and crimes against humanity. Uh, they were mayors of the village of Kabarondo in eastern Rwanda, and they were notably found guilty uh, for the massacre which took place on the 13th of April 1994, at the beginning of the genocide, when thousands of Tutsis from the village and the surrounding area uh, sought refuge refuge in the church there uh, and instead of finding refuge they were cornered inside came under attack uh, and thousands of them lost their lives according to the priest of the church who came here to testify uh, nearly 2,000 people were massacred in the space of just seven hours there was relief from victims and plaintiffs outside court we got reactions after the verdict it's a severe sentence but it's appropriate given the crimes they were accused of the victims are relieved. It's maybe the first time in France that a sentence is really adapted to the crimes committed in Cabarondo in Rwanda. This was the second Rwandan genocide case to wrap up here in France. The first one uh, found an army chief guilty back in 2040. They were allowed to take place in France because of a, a special UN ruling. Uh, but it also highlights the very complicated relations between France and Rwanda, which at one stage totally cut off diplomatic relations. Kigali accused Paris a long time uh, of shielding uh, genocide suspects. This case then also very important in terms of relations between the two countries. Catherine Norris Trent reporting there. Well, meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has arrived in Rwanda as he continues his four-nation tour of Africa. It's aimed at building business links and offering security cooperation in return for African support at the United Nations. Welcome by President Kagame Netanyahu on Wednesday visiting the Kigali Memorial Center and mourning the two nations' common history of genocide. Rwandan President Paul Kagame gave a warm welcome to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Both men are leaders of countries who have a tragic history marked by genocide. My people know the pain of genocide as well. And this is a unique bond that neither one of our peoples would prefer to have. Yet we both persevered despite the pain. Today Israel and Rwanda are successful states and models for progress. Netanyahu is touring four East African nations in a bid to boost economic and diplomatic ties. African countries are keen to gain access to Israel's defense expertise and products. Rwanda's relationship with traditional allies like the US and Britain has recently become strained after the constitution was changed so Kagame could run again. That's why Rwanda sees Israel as an alternative partner, especially regarding the sale of weapons. Already in 2014, Rwanda abstained at the UN from a resolution advocating the end of the occupation of Palestinian territories. Before leaving for Ethiopia, Netanyahu visited the Kigali Genocide Memorial, where a third of the 800,000 victims of the 1994 genocide are buried in mass graves. In South Africa, Olympic athlete Oscar Pistorius has been sentenced to six years in jail for the murder of girlfriend Riva Steenkamp. 29-year-old admitted shooting her through a toilet door in 2013, but always maintained he'd mistaken her for an intruder. The murder verdict came in December after Pistorius was initially found guilty of manslaughter. More than three years after murdering his girlfriend, Oscar Pistorius finally knows his fate. In the result, the sentence that I impose on the accused for the murder, dolus eventualis, of the deceased, 
that is Riva Stienkamp, is six years imprisonment. In her ruling, Judge Masipa said public opinion against Pistorius could play no role in the decision of the court. During a dramatic pre-sentencing hearing, the double amputee's lawyers asked him to walk around the courtroom without his prosthetic legs, a plea for leniency from the judge. The accused has punished himself and will punish himself for the rest of his life far more than any court of law can punish him. Pistorius shot Riva Steenkamp four times through a locked door at his home in the early hours of Valentine's Day 2013. He said he thought she was a burglar. The prosecution's star witness was Riva's father. My lady, it's been very difficult for me to forgive. But I feel the same that Oscar has to pay for what he did. He has to pay for it. After the sentencing, the Steenkamp family offered no comment on whether the state should appeal. The family has said it before. They wanted the law to run its course. It's done so. And no further comment. I will keep a dignified silence. Pistorius could be paroled in as little as three years. His defense team says he will not appeal the sentence. After being transferred to house arrest in October last year, Oscar Pistorius, the first amputee sprinter to ever compete in the Olympics, once again finds himself behind bars. In Zimbabwe, a wave of protest is putting increasing pressure on veteran President Robert Mugabe. Police firing warning shots in the capital Harare uh, this Wednesday as strikers vented their anger against the president's economic policies. This amid a currency shortage and with civil service salaries going unpaid. There's also widespread anger over alleged extortion going on at police roadblocks. Mugabe's ruled the country with an iron fist since coming to power in 1980. And dissent is rare, with the most recent mass demonstrations dating back to 1998. Senegal next, where filming's begun for the second series of a groundbreaking African TV show. C'est la vie, or That's Life, is set in a health centre and aims to entertain while teaching maternal and child health. Let's hope the programme could reach an audience of up to 100 million viewers. This report from our correspondent, Sarah Sackle. C'est la vie, or That's Life, has revived Rotanga, the imaginary working-class neighbourhood where the series is set. From the buxom doctor's assistant to the naive midwife, all the characters from season one are back in service around the same theme. On women, with women, for... I don't want to be super feminist and say for women, but it really concerns them from start to finish. C'est la vie features women around a workplace, the health centre in a working class area. As the plot thickens, viewers are made aware of issues ranging from maternal and child health to domestic violence. Serious topics delivered in an entertaining way, a balancing act for Marguerite Abouet, well known to comic strip fans. My characters have their own messages, so we don't need them to go over the top. From the moment that we know a woman has been beaten, we don't need to say anything more. It speaks for itself. Which is why it's important to create, to tell stories of the same standard as our characters. Created with a budget of around 30,000 euros for each episode, the show's entire technical team is pan-African, from the stage direction to the young producers. The series hasn't hired a bunch of amateurs, they're true professionals. The sound guy is from New York, the director is a young woman from Benin. It's a concentrate of Africa in this series and it employs Africans who found each other through an African subject. The filming of season two is expected to continue until mid-August. That's just about it for Iron Africa. A quick reminder that our reporter Jonathan Walsh is currently in Libya. He's been following Eid celebrations in the capital Tripoli and finding out about people's hopes and fears in a nation plunged into chaos following the fall of longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi. But where the fight against Islamic State jihadists appears to be making progress. You can see his report coming up in live from Paris just after 10 p.m. Paris time. It'll be hosted by Mark Owen, who's with you very shortly.
reporters. Chasing yields, increasing administrative constraints, falling prices, consumer distrust, isolation, debt. Factors which are pushing many farmers towards depression and even suicide. In France, a farmer commits suicide every two days. A silent toll, almost taboo, which expresses the extreme suffering of the men and women who are striving to earn a living from their hard work. Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.